Let's assume that we're able to measure two things, the degree of de jure judicial independence in a country and the degree of de facto judicial independence. Here comes the awkward question. If we increase de jure judicial independence, would we expect to also see an increase in de facto judicial independence? In other words, does de jure judicial independence cause de facto judicial independence? Here are three reasons to be sceptical. First, the correlation between de jure and de facto judicial independence. Here's a plot based on data from an article from Lars Feld and Stefan Voigt, an article I discussed in a previous video on de jure judicial independence. The plot shows de jure judicial independence on the horizontal axis and de facto judicial independence on the vertical axis. The solid blue line shows the best fitting straight line through these points, and the dotted line shows what we would expect if these two points lined up exactly. As you can see, lots of points are quite far away from the solid blue line. Some countries have high de facto judicial independence whilst having low de jure independence. Switzerland is one such example. Other countries have high de jure independence but low de facto independence. Here, Russia stands out. As a result of this scatter, the correlation between these two measures is quite low at 0.18. And whilst a strong correlation is no guarantee of causation, the absence of a strong correlation, especially for two concepts that sound so obviously connected as de jure and de facto judicial independence, well, it's pretty worrying. Second, regression models of de facto judicial independence, which use multiple different aspects of de jure judicial independence, fail to show any overall effects. This plot comes from an article by James Melton and Tom Ginsberg. It's a coefficient plot, or a plot which shows the partial association between each variable, down the rows, and de facto judicial independence. Plotted points far over to the right, like democracy, have a strong positive association with de facto judicial independence. Melton and Ginsburg break down their index of judicial independence into its component parts, testing separately for the effects of selection procedure, removal procedure, and so on. In other words, they give themselves more chances to find an effect by testing lots of different things. But even when they do this, and control for lots of other characteristics which might affect de facto judicial independence, all of their effects are consistent with a true effect of zero. Third, the timing of changes in de facto and de jure judicial independence. We would ordinarily expect that increases in de jure judicial independence would come before increases in de facto judicial independence. But it seems as though it's the other way around. This plot, from the same article by Melton and Ginsburg, shows that the average level of de facto judicial independence went up globally before the average level of de jure independence went up. So it seems that there is little strong evidence that de jure independence generally leads to de facto judicial independence. You can, of course, search for particular conditions where the effect is stronger. Melton and Ginsburg go on to argue that de jure independence has a stronger effect than de facto independence in autocratic regimes. I think this might be a ceiling effect, or an effect which appears just because democracies typically max out at high levels of de facto judicial independence. But you should read the full article if you're interested in their reasoning.